We are so blessed to have this opportunity together here today for this very special service. This service recognizes that every individual believer has been uh, gifted by the Holy Spirit in one way or the other for the purpose of service. But we may not know or we may not know how to serve God. We may not know where to begin. We may not know uh, how to present ourselves. And therefore, we seek to use this service for the time the Lord will allow us to encourage each and everyone to arise and serve God. So, I'm avoiding to call it a leadership service. Uh, but if I was to make you quickly understand, it will be a service to encourage you into leadership. The encouragement will be seeing you put to practice that which the Lord speaks to us. For the purpose of uh, just laying the foundation, today we'll just do an introduction. Then we'll go into a lot of things in the near future. So for the purpose of laying the foundation, Let's look at the scriptures that we already know very well. Uh, let's begin with the First Peter chapter 4 and verse number 10. So this scripture here, this passage of the Bible will govern us continually in what we are doing. Uh, I remember there's a time we took a lot of time to uh, study this particular passage of the Bible. Uh, but, I, but I reckon also even in the Old Testament after Moses had given the law there was need for a second reading and that's why we have Deuteronomy. So we read it the first time and there's need for a second reading. So the Bible says as each one so if you love your Bible you need to start marking these words each one and each one is you you can even write here your name as each one has received, received a gift, a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's put our focus on a few words here. I have a, I have a liking, I have a liking for the Bible language and particular words that the Bible uses. So when the Bible says, as each one, those of us who are seated here must reach an understanding that Christian service is not for the chosen few. It's not for those ones. It's not for, let's see what the pastor will do. Let's see what the elders will do. Christian service is for each and every single believer in Christ Jesus. If you have believed in Christ, definitely you are a leader. Or let me say you are a servant. You are a servant of Christ. You are a servant of Christ. Let's have a 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. So look at 1 Corinthians 12 7. It says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Each one. Laziness has come into the church that we think there are those people who have been called to serve and others have been called to spectate and criticize or to be entertained. Those of us who are here, we need to individually take responsibility and know that God has called you as an individual, never corporately. The calling of God is never corporate. Is an individual. Take responsibility. Take responsibility. Take responsibility. And know that God has called you as an individual. 
Never always look on your sides or in front of you or behind you and say, I know he will do it. You are the one that God has called to do it. Take responsibility. Each one. You have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Each one. So it's not some people, but every individual believer. Go down to verse 13. Verse says, for by one spirit we were, look at this, we were, we were, all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So the very moment you believe in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit has two instantaneous things it does in your life. Number one, to come and dwell in you forever. And number two, to identify you with the body of Christ Jesus. To baptize is to identify with. To put you in union with the body of Christ. And if you look at the tenses here, we were. It's a past thing. The Holy Spirit has done his work. We all we have all been made, have all been made, have all been made. The Holy Spirit has done his work. He has come to indwell us eternally and he has put us in union with Christ Jesus eternally. It is not something that you are expecting to happen that one day I'll, I'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and I serve God. One day I'll be indwelled with the Holy Spirit and I serve God. No. The very moment you believe on Christ Jesus, instantaneously, the Holy Spirit immerses you in Christ, in the body of Christ, and makes you one with Christ. You become part of the body of Christ. And number two, he comes to indwell you. You drink of him. He comes to indwell you forever, never, ever to live again. And when the Holy Spirit comes in you, he comes with all that God has purposed that you function in this life. Every function that God has purpose intended for you, the Holy Spirit comes and deposits in you. Yes, it needs culturing, it needs growth, but not that it's not there, it is there. So let's go back to here. As each one has received a gift, so you cannot be here and say you are a believer in Christ Jesus and you have no spiritual gifts. And you have seen that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Why? So that all may profit. All may profit. Now, very important to note. You start realizing that you are in Christian service when your life begins to impact the lives of other people. Not when you have good names or good titles. You can have a title which has no impact even in your own children's life, in your neighbor's life, in your friend's lives, in the brethren's life, in the congregation of the saints. Then you are not serving. Christian service begins at a point when what you say or what you do has an impact in other people's life. The goodness of it is that it never depends on you. It depends on the enablement of the Holy Spirit within you. Your only part is the willingness to submit and serve God. Taking responsibility. The greatest challenge in many African churches has been to take responsibility. Someone to say, I am the one responsible in this area. The, the world system gives us a, a way of working which you must be supervised. Uh, then you must be paid. Then uh, you must be mistreated sometimes. They load it over you. You see, if you work in a company or an institution, 
sometimes the bosses ask you to do things that are impossible, that you even yourself, you cannot do it. They load it over you. But in Christendom, in the church, God will never give you an assignment that he does not want to accomplish through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. The problem is our flesh. And our flesh will always manifest in two ways. Number one is fear of failure. That I may not know how to do it right. Fear of failure. So you live your all time saying, one day I'll preach the gospel. One day I'll just knock these doors and witness. One day yes, I'll, I'll do this and this. You, you are always th threatening God. Eh? You are always threatening. Threatening. One day. Because you fear, maybe you don't have what it takes to move in. If you have a desire to do something, begin now. Because when you start doing something and fail, you are already a step ahead. At least you have begun. You are a step ahead. If you begin and fail, you already have a success. You have begun. And people can talk about you because they have seen what you are able to do. So the manifestation of the flesh when it comes to service is fear of failure or of pride that tells you that I'm not the only one. Other people can do it. Do it. So you neglect your responsibility because of pride. Pride says that uh, I'm the one who did this last time. I did it this time. I did it this time. Must I be the only one doing it? Remember the story of Moses. God told Moses that uh, these guys have no water. So what you do, Moses, strike the rock and the rock will give you water. And Moses strikes the rock and the rock gives water. And the children of Israel are refreshed. But behind the mind of Moses, it was like, I did it. I'm a great guy, I did it. I always wonder why God calls Moses the humble guy. Then, the next time they are in the same, same situation, Moses is told, hey, Moses, speak to the rock, it will give you water. And you know what Moses does? He calls the children of Israel first and quarrels them. He asks them, where do you want me to get you water from? Why are you always disturbing me? You rebels. He calls, actually, actually calls them rebels. Then he says, okay, let me see what to do. God tells him, Moses, I said, you speak to the rock, it will give you water. He goes again, and strikes the rock because he's annoyed. He wants to prove that he's the one doing it. Because if, if he speaks to the rock, people will not see him doing something that he needs praise for. Him. He'll be praised for. So he strikes the rock again. And we have come to understand that according to the uh, uh, New Testament that the rock speaks about Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus was crucified only once. He was struck only once. And after that, you just pray and uh, fellowship with him and read his word and equip yourself and he gives you what it takes to move on. It's not about you. But pride will tell you that you are the one doing it. If it's your money, I'm spending so much money. I'm spending so much time. I'm using so much skill in this church. I'm, 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 I'm the only one doing this. So you feel like you are the one. Fear and pride are sisters that are overcoming you the area of serving God. So, each one and all, if you come back here, as each one has received a gift, I remember when I was teaching about spiritual gifts here, someone asked me, how do I know my gifts? I said, do everything in the church until you settle on one thing. Be here in the morning and sweep the church and clean, and clean the church and arrange chairs. Who told you that's a lower spiritual gift? When you see people singing here, come and sing with your voice. Let, let people hear your voice only as if the speakers are spoiled. But there are some voices like mine. When I sing, I see Andrew checking the speakers. Are they okay? But me, I don't care. If I feel like singing, I sing. I sing to the Lord. But I've not found my gift in singing. Do everything until you settle on what, what God has called you to do. You will find peace. 
you'll find appreciation from people, you'll find people's lives changing because of what you do, then you start dropping many other things and stick on what God called you to do. Stop supervising other people. Stop. Stop it. It's not godly. If you are busy serving God in your area, you have no time to supervise other people. You have no time to look at the mistakes and limitations and how other people have done it wrongly because you are so busy in your area of calling. In fact, you appreciate each other because what someone else is doing is helping you do what you are doing and what you are doing is helping other person do and the church is growing healthy. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. So the thing that you need to notice is that the gift you have is never one for you to minister to yourself. It's never for you alone. And two, it's never for your glory. Even if nobody appreciates you, wake up every morning knowing that you are in the newspapers of heaven. You are on the front line of the newspapers of heaven every day. If you are serving God diligently, you don't need men to appreciate you. If they appreciate you, well and good. If they don't, that's not your problem. That's not your problem. Because the moment you want to please people, you can never serve God. Galatians chapter 1. Verse 10. Let's go to verse 10. It says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I will not be a bond servant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not a According to man. I know, even myself, I like when I preach and you are clapping and you are saying amen. You are saying that is deep man of God. That is powerful. Continue. Sounds good. But it only pleases my flesh. If I teach and you are so quiet and then I see you applying in your life, growing in grace and in the knowledge of Christ, those are more rewarding results than clapping and saying, hey, that's mine. I receive it. That's deep. It's more rewarding. Just seeing the transformation in your life because of the word spoken to you is more rewarding. But shouting, hey, that's deep, and seeing retrogression, it has no meaning in my life. It has no meaning. Most people will shout, but you look for any impact of that word they are shouting about. Actually, a research has been done. Most people who say, Amen, Hallelujah, if you pull them aside and ask them, what were you getting at that time? They have no idea. And they may tell you something that you actually never spoke. Students look like you now. What do students look like? You, you listen, you take notes, you believe, you understand, you apply. As each one has received a gift, minister, minister is to serve. In the Bible we have Bible stories just to read for your knowledge and uh, reference. Bible has facts and the Bible has also commands. Bible has imperatives. Bible has advices also. So that, does this look like a story, an advice, or an imperative? As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Is that a command or a request? So it's a command. Now, a command can only have two responses. Number one, obey. What is obey? And nobody can ask you how to respond to a command. You make a choice how you want to respond to a divine command. This one is definite as each one has received. The Bible is not saying as each one may receive. It's not may receive. Has received is definite. Has received. So it's definite you have received. There's no doubt about that. You have received a gift. 
Now the command is minister it to one another. So, since you have received a gift, minister it to one another. Let your gift serve others. And choose. Choose today that your gift should serve other people. Choose it. Make a choice today. Do everything. Do everything. And because of serving others, God lifts you up. Let's bring it to the Kawaida life. If you are employed in a company, what can give you promotion? Your diligent service. Isn't you? There is the inverse theory in Christianity that every time you want to grow up, you go down. Do you hear that? If you have a desire to go up, you don't start going up. You start going down in Christianity. I'll just show you in a little while. So, minister it to one another and then you are being told, why should you do that? Because you are good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Manifold. Now don't you ever say that I cannot do this. It says, as each of you has received a gift, mm -hmm. that is a particular spiritual talent, uh -huh. a gracious divine endowment, yes. employ it Employ it. Employ it for one another Hold as on. a benefit. What is to employ? To employ is to put to use. Employ is to put to use. So employ it to? Employ it to one another uh -huh. as, as it befits. Good trustee of God's many-sided grace. Many-sided grace. Many-sided grace. The manifold grace of God. The many-sided grace of God. Faithful stewards of extremely diverse power, diverse power, and gifts granted to Christians by unmerited favor. Look at that. Have you discovered that even when a church is planted somewhere, somehow the pastor knows how to fix equipment. Somehow the pastor has the energy to carry speakers from somewhere and bring them in the church. Somehow, somehow the pastor knows how to lead worship. Somehow he can clean the church and arrange the seats. But as the church grows and other people come, you find that there's that delegation of labor and the pastor remains with the pastoral responsibilities. Why is one person able to do all this? It's because of the manifold, many-sided grace of God. Just you as an individual, God can use you in every area that is lacking in this church. If you believe, say amen. Because the grace of God is manifold. God is looking for an available and willing vessel that he can use. Not the obvious vessels. You know, you may be sitting there and thinking about Pastor Chris will do it. Derek will do it. The moment you start thinking like that, I want you to notice you are the one God is calling to do that thing. I hope you hear me. Every time you feel that this thing needs to be done, but so and so is the one who will do it. I want you to notice that God is calling your attention to that area that you may serve. You are the one now who is saying, God, not me. Please send so and so. You have become like Moses. The grace of God is manifold. You go and research on this. Go and research on this. You'll be amazed how God wants to use you if only you make yourself available. If only you make yourself willing. If only you have the eagerness to serve God. Every moment, every moment, you have that eagerness to serve God. God is willing to use you in ways that you have never known before. Look at verse 11. If anyone speaks. So there are those gifts that you speak. There are very many people who want just your encouragement. And you have closed your mouth. People just want that phone call. People are just that visit to be told it's okay. The Lord is still on the throne. There are people who just want you to just talk to them for five minutes. You are always in a hurry. Let me tell you something. 
you don't help people spiritually because you have what it takes to solve their problems. In many cases, many servants of God, if they are honest, they'll tell you, when someone is presenting their problem before them, they have no idea how to handle that problem. But as they listen and they are praying about it, uh, then they, they hear voices in them. They hear directions. They hear a small voice telling them, say this. All you need to do as a child of God is to open your mouth. And you'll hear wisdom flowing out of you that at the end of it, you want to be honest and tell God, I know that was not me. That wasn't me. Make yourself available. The neighbors need you. Some of you, even your family, your own family needs you. But you have closed your mouth. You are always mourning. I don't know what you are mourning. Gloom is all over you. There are those gifts that demand that you speak. But look at this. The Bible says, as the oracles of God. It's just not something that will happen supernaturally. Also, you must give yourself to it. being equipped, learning the word of God, praying. Then God uses you as a vessel. Because those days of God speaking to people, ah, my son, I don't know if they are still there. You are the one that God has employed on this world to speak to people. If you spend the whole day in your bedroom and you even talk about it, you think that is something so good. People are dying outside there. People are suffering. Your neighbors are so discouraged. Your friends are so discouraged. Your, your family is so frustrated. The church of God is so discouraged. You are needed to speak. Say something to somebody. Say something to somebody. Even the people that you don't think they need to hear from you. You can look at a man like Derek and feel, ah, this guy is doing okay. He has a good job. He is, no. He's driving. Everything seems. He needs your, your, your encouragement. You may never know. When you just start talking to him, you'll see him open up. From the outside, people look so successful. They look that they are doing well. Speak to someone. Open your mouth and speak. Make yourself available. But God will help you because that's the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, these are actions, deeds, good works. Let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. Look at it. Make yourself available. Do good works. Present yourself. Every time you hear there's a need for action, present yourself. And the Bible says, God will provide the ability for you to do that. You know, we have a problem with Christians. They do something small here. You hear them bragging. They come and see me and say, I pity them. So minister, do good works, do deeds, act. But let it be done with the ability which God supplies. Now, what is God's ability? God is all powerful. Omnipotent God. So if you are doing it with the ability that God supplies, then you are doing it with the omnipotency of God, which means if God is using you, then there is no task that will be given to you that will be impossible. Amen? Nothing will be given to you that is impossible because God is the one who supplies that ability. And after God has supplied that ability, the Bible says that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs glory and the dominion forever, ever. Amen. So in all things, God may be glorified. So after you have served, whether Pastor Mwale recognizes and tells you, oh, you are the best man I have, this, you are the greatest woman I have, you are the greatest youth here, oh, I love the way you do it. If, whether he does it or not, let God be glorified by your work. Amen. What hurts most believers is because we need the appraisal or approval of fellow men. You need the appraisal or approval of fellow men. And when men don't approve you, you are so demoralized. You are so frustrated. When men don't recognize your efforts, recognize your, 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 your ability, you are so demoralized. We need to wake up 
and come out of those kind of things. Let's go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. I'll just read it through it quickly from verse 1 to verse 5. Uh, but I'll look at verse 5 briefly, then we'll pick up from there next Sunday. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, I want you to listen keenly from here, from verse 3 to 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambitions or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each one esteem others better than himself. <clears throat> let each one of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So let's just look at verse 4 and 5. Let each one of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Now, I want you to be honest with yourself. And don't talk to anybody. Just be honest with yourself. When did you wake up one day caring about a brother in this church or a sister in this church? Just caring about them, praying about for them, looking for them, finding out are they okay? When is the last? Don't talk about it. Just, but when is the last time you did like that? Not even a brother in this church. Your mother, your father, your sisters, your brothers. Your neighbors. Or we have these cliches that everyone for, everyone for himself, God for us all. When is the last time you woke up even uh, asking yourself, is my pastor okay? At least I have a few girls in this church who call me and tell me, Pastor, we just called to ask, are you okay? Is everything okay with you? And I'm like, okay. Ah, uh, meaning you too. You know, Pastor Takwaka Mganga, ukimpigia sibu kwa unashida gani? <laughs> but people call you to ask you, you just say, I just wanted to find out, are you doing okay? I'm like, wow. Yani mungu, umefaya tu ya menifikiria, amenipigia simu, what an encouragement that is. Nazi ya tiniombe, kuna kitu fulani, oh, pastor, ima mbo yangu, yeni mzuri, so, isi kukunikubaza, nasi kuhizi, apana. I just call to ask you, to find out if you are doing okay. That's a great blessing. <laughs> when is the last time you called me? I'm not saying you answer, but when is the last time you called me? Also, when is the last time you called another person and just let each one of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others? When is the last time you came to church and you had a good message and you said, I'm not going to sleep until I share with someone else? When is the last time you had plenty in your house and you said, uh uh, this food is much more than I need this week? Let me just look for someone and share because I know someone is hungry somewhere. You know, we are always happy to eat a half of the plate and to throw the other plate in the dustbin, not knowing that maybe your neighbor does not even have a morsel. When is the last time you just checked on a brother and you just want to know if he has food that day? Each, each other's interests. But this is what I want you to do for today. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, I remember there's this one day we were excited. We were after a very successful uh, conference somewhere. We have packed our bags. We want to come to Nairobi. We have prayed. Then when we step out of the hotel, the first thing we notice is we have a flat tie. So what do you do at that time? Just continue driving. You must stop and change or fix that flat tie. So the stagnancy we have in uh, serving God is because we have a flat tire called attitude. We have a wrong attitude toward God and a wrong attitude towards men. When men need your service, you think they are disturbing you. When God needs your service, you want him to understand that you are a busy man, not available, you will do it another day. You want him to understand your excuses because none of us 
understands that that God is a master. We may not be teaching the Lordship of Christ Jesus, but he's still Lord. When Paul says, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, you are a slave, you are a willing slave. Now what we all know, in this world, there is no sphere of freedom. There is no place that you can be that this place is called freedom. Spiritually, we were slaves to sin. We were in, in the bondage of sin. And when we get born again, we become slaves of righteousness. There's no sphere of freedom. When you hear if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. It means when he sets you free from sin, you are free indeed from sin. Not that you are free indeed, you have entered a sphere of freedom where you can do what you want to do the way you want to do it. No. You come in his kingdom and there's righteousness to show you the path that you must walk on. You leave your father's house because you think your father's house, uh, your father is being too harsh for you. He doesn't want you to go out when you want to go out. You get married. So does your husband allow you to go out with that the way you want? It's from one prison to another prison. Even as husbands, we are also limited in the way we just don't do things the way we want to do it. We ask questions. It depends where your wife comes from. She can ask you some questions that you can never answer. A whole man. There is no freedom in the house. You don't just remove your shoes and put them where you want to put. There's a woman there who will discipline you. Hakuna freedom. So if you are looking for a sphere of freedom that you can behave the way you want to behave, do what you want to do, is nowhere in this world. Because in sin, according to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 3, you do what Satan wants you to do. In Christianity, according to Romans 6, 18, you do what righteousness wants you to do. We must change our attitudes and know that we are in a kingdom. And a kingdom has a king and has citizens. And all the citizens of the kingdom, they do the bidding of the king. And therefore, the moment you start looking at Christ Jesus as your master and yourself as a bond servant, then your attitude towards God becomes aligned with the will of God. From next week, we'll start going into other deeper things. But look at it. Two brothers send their mother. Go and tell Jesus that uh, we have ambitions for greatness. And this greatness is just, it's not far away from him. It must be in his kingdom. And we want to be one on the left and one on the right. And Jesus never rebuked the mother, or never rebuked them for seeking for greatness. I want you to think about it. Because greatness is a good thing in the kingdom. But he pointed them to the right path that leads to greatness. He told them that if you want to be great, then go down. Become servants of other people, then you will become great. He told them in this kingdom, it operates differently. The principles are different. You are not just promoted. Your promotion comes when you go down. And that's why the Bible says, God gives more grace to the humble. I, I thought Christ would rebuke them and told them, it's wrong to have ambitions, it's wrong to wish to be great. No, 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 no. He must sweep this church. He must go down. Go to Sunday school and pass the Sunday school first. Christianity needs humility. And until we fix our attitudes, first of all towards God, God being our master, and then towards each other, towards each other, looking out for the interests of one another, until that is done, if we look at each other with suspicion, with hatred, with malice, with the, all kinds of envy, jealous, and all kinds of these things, you need to see that so and so is the one leading the service today you and you are happy. I'm happy to see uh, this young man leading the service. He's making many mistakes, but he's learning on the way. That's having the interest of one another. Not saying that if the, I'm the one who was there, I could, not, I could not have done that. Why do you think God didn't allow you to be there? So you need to see other people trying to serve God, making mistakes, and go and encourage them. Use the good they have done to encourage them, advise them on how to do it better next time. 
So when we look at each other, our attitude must be that of, I want you to be better. I'm seeking for your good, for your highest good. Not that you may do something for me, but just because of the love of God. I want you to be increased. I want you to see you do better. Not to group two, three people and send back by the sister. You are not a supervisor here. You have been called into Christian service. And the quicker you realize that, the quicker you start serving God, the more peace you will have. I will say it again. Until you discover and walk in your purpose on earth, peace is still a mirage for you. Because you are not aligned with the reason why you exist on this earth, peace will be a mirage for you. I want to challenge you to the core so that we can have a few women and a few men standing who are willing to serve God. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manful grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, in your Bible, you need to notice that you can speak, but it's God who enables you. You can minister, it is still God who enables you, the one who supplies the ability. But again, after you have served God, God should be glorified, not you. You are a vessel through which God is using, and people will look at you and know that you are a good servant of God, and men will appreciate you, men will approve you, because of your gift is not for yourself, your gift is impacting other people's life and people will approve you. People will appraise you. People will uh, appreciate you because of what you are doing. Don't impose yourself over people. If you have a calling of God and the calling of God is affecting people's life, I will know and I'll address you in accordance with that calling. Praise God. Let's rise up on our feet. Dear friend, you may have watched this message and yet you are not born again. It's not an accident, but God's plan. All you need to do now is believe that Christ Jesus died on the cross and settled the penalty for all your sins. When you rely only on this finished work, you become the righteousness of God because all your sins are forgiven. You become a child of God with all the rights of a son. You will never ever perish because you have eternal life, the very life of God. You are welcome to worship with us every Sunday from 10 a.m. We are located at Umoja Inako Estate along Moy Drive, directly opposite the Umoja 2 Chief's Office, Nairobi, Kenya.